her to pan over there to Bob Murphy, who was one of the leading experts in macroeconomics from an Austrian point of view. Raise your hand, Bob, so we can figure out who you are. And if you ask me any tough questions, I'll just refer you to him. <laughs> um. <laughs> well, I said he specializes in macro, and that's not really weather. Okay, uh, what's going on with Austrian economics? Austrian economics has nothing to do with the economics of Austria, nor does Chicago school economics have anything to do with the economics of the city of Chicago. The reason it's called Chicago economics is because its most famous uh, creators, Milton Friedman, Stigler, Becker, are all professors or were professors at Chicago. Similarly, Austrian economics is so named because its progenitors, creators, um, uh, Menger, Bombavirk, Mises, Hayek, uh, all came from Austria. Austrian economics isn't really, how shall I say it, uh, accepted in the mainstream. Uh, the mainstream people, if you would ask them what is Austrian economics, they would use the C word, cult. Um, I've got some Kool-Aid here for you people. No, <laughs> just kidding. Um, I'm not into polygamy or anything like that. The reason they consider Austrianism as a cult because it's not an empirical science the way we see it. The way the mainstream sees economics is as an empirical science. What's an empirical science? Well, ideally you have controlled experiments like chemistry. You take something, uh, you break it into two, you treat this with fire or water or pressure or temperature and you don't do that. And then any difference between the two you attribute to what you did, namely you have controlled experiments. We sort of have quasi-controlled experiments in economics, but not really. For example, North and South Korea, East and West Germany, the same people, the same culture, the same language, the same pretty much everything. And due to an accident of history, they were rent asunder, and one of them followed this system, and one of them followed that system. 10, 15 years later, there are big differences to which we might be tempted to attribute to a different system, but it's harder because people can say, well, they didn't have the right commie leaders. You know, you, there's always an excuse. It's not definitive. In economics, uh, we Austrians believe that economics is really a branch not of uh, empirical science, but rather a branch of logic. Uh, and just as you don't test the Pythagorean theorem, you don't test to see if a triangle has got 180 degrees, you don't test economic axioms. For example, I claim that if we make a voluntary trade of this tie for this young lady's, what's that thing you got here? Cell phone. Cell phone. I'm losing my mind. I'm getting old. As long as I don't drool, you'll be okay. Uh, if we trade uh, this tie for the cell phone, it must mean that this young lady, your name is? Jessica, Jessica values the tie, weirdo, <laughs> more than the cell phone, and I value the cell phone more than the tie in the ex ante sense of expectations. Later on, she might regret the error of her ways and see, well, it's a lousy tie, it's got Mises on it, and who wants it? So she might regret it afterward, but in the anticipation sense, you don't test that. If you understand the English language, you understand that the reason she early engaged in this trade with me was because she thought she would benefit. She'd make a profit. She's a dirty profiteer, as am I, because I would make profit of the difference in value that I place on the cell phone over the tie, and she would make profit based on what she thinks of the tie over the cell phone. So we mutually exploit each other, namely we cooperate. And you can't test that. What kind of a test could there be? There are many other economic axioms, none of which can be tested, all of which might be illustrated, as I've just done, but can't be tested. And for this reason, Austrian economics is relegated to the outer reaches of economics as a cult. On the anarchist part, my motto is, if it moves, privatize it. If it doesn't move, privatize it. Since everything either moves or doesn't move, you privatize everything, including every government function, armies, courts, police, roads, whatever. It's a little radical, but what the heck trying to have fun here. Okay, now what I'd like to do with this brief introduction is to get into my assigned topic, uh, why are we having this financial mess? It's very, uh, you can sort of read it right from the headlines. I've got today's New York Times, and it says that the following companies are laying off, oh, various tens of thousands of people, Caterpillar, um, Pfizer, Home Depot, Sprint. Microsoft also has laid off a few thousand people. 
So why is it? Why do we have this economic crisis? Why is it that we have either a recession or a depression? Why do we have it? What caused it? Uh, what's the best way to get out of it? Will bailouts do it or not? Uh, will Barack Obama, uh, who is a new FDR, will his policies uh, succeed? My claim is that they won't, that the reason for the problem in the first place is government. Begins with a G, that's a hint if you didn't get it. Um, let me introduce the Austrian business cycle theory through the triangle. This is something that is used by Austrians, but not by the mainstream. For the mainstream, it's sort of, they're all Keynesians now. There, there was once uh, this wonderful quote from um, Samuelson quoted, who was it, Friedman? Is that right? Uh, saying we're all Keynesians now. And I spoke to Milton Friedman and I asked him, is, is Samuelson right in saying that even you are a Keynesian now? Keynesian means pretty much that the way to get out of depressions and recessions is to have government um, stimulus programs and government spending. And uh, what Milton Friedman said, and I'll give you a paraphrase, he said, when it comes to the um, public policy recommendations, there's a gigantic gap between us Chicago and free enterprisers and those Keynesian um, interventionists. But when it comes to the tools of analysis, we're all Keynesians now. I thought that was pretty good on, on the part of Samuelson, who was a left-wing economist. Friedman is supposedly a right-wing one. Because it seems to me that the tools of analysis are more important than the public policy recommendations because the public policy recommendations emanate from the tools of analysis. In other words, the tools of analysis come first and then you make recommendations based on your analytics. Well, what the Keynesian Keynesians and the Chicago Keynesians all agree upon is that the uh, economy is sort of like a car. Uh, it veers off to, what is it, Charybdis or Scylla, the, you know, the two Greek uh, bad guys. Uh, or it, it either it doesn't go fast enough or, it doesn't, or it's going uh, too fast. So if it's going too slow, you put on the gas. If it's going too fast, you put on the brake. In other words, the economy can't be trusted to uh, be self-regulating, which is very much the opposite of what Adam Smith said. What Adam Smith said with the invisible hand is that people are led by greed or self-seeking in order to do best for them. But uh, in so doing, they are led by the invisible hand, which he thought was God's hand, to do that which is in the best interest of everyone. Well, I'm more of an Adam Smithian here than either Friedman or Keynes. I believe that the economy has within it the ability to be self-regulating, that all of our uh, selfish actions, for example, the, the, the trade that we just made for the cell phone and the tie, self-seeking and yet we each help each other. So out of greed or avarice comes mutual, mutual support and benefit. The only difference between the monetarists and the, the Keynesians between Harvard and Chicago is that some believe in monetary policy, government of monetary policy, other believe in fiscal policy, spending and taxing. But to me that's, you know, that's a debate over superficialities. The, the key is, can the economy work on its own or does it need a kickstart or a, a nanny state to work it? And uh, we Austrians, um, Austro-Libertarians, believe that the economy is just fine without government regulation that all the problems, whether it's the weather or the depression, is due to government in the first place. And the solution is to get government out of the problem because all it does is screw up everything. And also it's coercive. Uh, which is uh, sort of a moral problem. Um, in the market, this trade, it was a voluntary trade. But suppose I didn't want to give her my tie and I, I just wanted to grab her cell phone. Now I'm acting governmentally. <laughs> because all the government is is a robber gang with good PR, uh, democracy. You know, Look, suppose that she's bigger than me and tougher than me and I'm afraid to grab that thing because all you guys are watching, you might put me in jail. But instead, I'm a great demagogue and I say, look, the public interest consists of her giving me that uh, cell phone. I don't have one. I'm cell phone deprived, whatever. She's got three of them. Who knows? And uh, somehow we have a democratic vote and you all say, yeah, I can have her cell phone because I'm poor or something. Does that make it any more just? No. Uh, there's such a thing called tyranny of the majority. So the two go together, deontology and utilitarianism. 
that which is in the human interest or benefit is also what justice is, and justice and human benefit go together. They're not inconsistent. Okay, what's going on with the Austrian triangle? The way the Austrians look at the economy is that there's a triangle. And here is, this axis is money or GDP or something, and this one is time or stages of production. This would be consumption. This would be retailing, wholesaling. Uh, this would be maybe manufacturing. Uh, this would be basic industries, maybe cement. This would be mining or heavy industry. Namely, the stuff out here, th the way you start, if you're going to have a um, anything other than a hand-to-mouth economy where you just sort of grab a fish and eat it. You have to have capital goods. You have to have um, roundabout methods of production, which Bomberwerk, one of the Austrian economists, uh, emphasized. So the way things go is first you mine metal. You use the metal in uh, maybe uh, building a machine, a, a, a tractor. You, you uh, farm or build stuff. Uh, here might be the, uh, the bread in the warehouse. Here is the bread in the bakery, and now you consume it. In contrast, what the mainstream people do is they have a thing called K for capital, and that's it. It's sort of a homogeneous blob. Think Play-Doh. It's infinitely malleable, whereas the way we see things, they have to sort of fit with each other. Not everything that is here can be used here or vice versa. There are some things like uh, Blasting powder, which really can't uh, help you bake a, a bread. And if you have to switch from one to the other, it's a pain in the neck because, the, because capital is uh, heterogeneous. It's not homogeneous. It's not infinitely malleable from one to the other. Okay. So there are various kinds of societies. For example, this society is sort of a hand-to-mouth society. It's got consumption and then maybe one stage. Stage one and then consumption. Uh, th this would be um, a very little capital equipment in very few stages and very little time dimension between the beginning of the process and the end of the process. Whereas this kind of an economy would be uh, one with a lot of income. And this one obviously is faster than that one. Everyone following my beautiful art here? Questions about what I'm saying? Uh, one of the benefits of Austrian economics is that it's just sort of common sense. And I'm hoping that you can see that the economies are like this. That some are more capital intensive, others less. Some uh, very impatient. Some very patient. Uh, this would have a high interest rate. This would have a low interest rate. This is an economy of six-year-olds. If you ask a six-year-old, which would you rather have, a chocolate bar now or 10 chocolate bars tomorrow? Now. Impatient, because they, they can't visualize tomorrow. It, it's sort of theoretical, whereas the chocolate bar right now really looks good. So people like that are not going to save too much. Right? They're, they're patient. They want to consume. There, there are people like that. And then there are other people who have very, very long uh, uh, time dimensions. And if we have saving and investment on an interest rate thingy, supply and demand of loans, the interest rate over here would be very high because a lot of people would want to borrow money. So the interest rate will be high. And nobody wants to lend money in a society like that. Whereas in this sort of society, again, if you have supply and demand of loanable funds or money or investments, uh, here they would be willing to supply. They'd be willing to lend money. So there are a lot of lenders here. So the way it works out is you have a vertical interest rate here and you have a triangle like that. Here you have a high interest rate and a triangle like that. And if the triangle changes, so that, let's say, we were like this, and now we go to a more moderate 
triangle. This is sort of an, an intermediate triangle, right? Well, this means that all of a sudden investments out here are more valuable and money will shift toward longer run kinds of things. Whereas when interest rates are very high, it's very hard to justify a project of uh, 50 years because you have to heavily discount money receivable in the future. Everyone into discounting money. Look, if I uh, give you a dollar, and I say, here is a dollar, and it's due in one year from now, and I promise I'll give it to you, and we assume away any possibility of me reneging, and we also assume away inflation. You heard about the joke of the economist and the can opener? No? There's a physicist, a chemist, and an economist on an island, and they've got cans of food but no can opener. So they're discussing, well, how do we, you know, how do we get it done? Get her done, as they say. And uh, the physicist says, well, let's drop it from a certain height onto a rock and it'll open up and we'll eat it. And the chemist says, well, a chemical um, solution is better. Let's heat it up and it'll open up the can and we'll have hot food. So they turn to the economist and say, how can you help in our deliberations? And he says, assume a can opener. Uh, we have to assume things because we don't have controlled experiments. So let's assume that there's no inflation and that this money is due for sure in one year. How much will you pay for it right now? Suppose I have a bid, a, a bidding process. Let's see if I have a dollar here. I don't know if I have a dollar. Yeah, there's a dollar. I say, I'll give this to you. So the winner of this auction. You're not going to make any profit. <laughs> no, no, no. You don't bid a dollar. Who's going to, what do you bid? <laughs> Minus infinity. <laughs> Come on, we've got to be capitalist pigs. Namely, I have to pay you an infinite amount of money to take this crappy dollar. That's the first bid. But somebody will bid higher than minus infinity. Somebody bid 50 cents. Well, will anybody bid 51 cents? Where will the bidding stop? And what's the criteria for where the bidding will stop? The criteria is the interest rate. Because if the interest rate is 10%, how much money would you have to put in the bank right now in order to get a dollar in a year from now, assuming no inflation and for sure the banks don't go kablooey? How much? 90, 91 cents, something like that. So if the interest rate is, is 10%, the top bid, say, is uh, 90 cents. Everyone follow? If the interest rate is 5%, then the top bid is 95 cents. Because there's a ceiling on the bids. Because you can always put the money in the bank. You don't have to buy my crappy dollar. Okay. So we have to discount future earnings, future income streams. And by the way, if it was, um, uh, say, instead of um, one year, 100 years, the interest rate, you see here, it's just five cent difference. But if it was 100 years, it would be a tremendous difference uh, between uh, those two interest rates. Namely, the, the more time and the higher the interest rate, the less value, the more heavily we discount stuff in the future. Or let's take this. Suppose it was a dollar receivable in two years. Uh, take the dollar receivable in 100 years. How much would you have to put in the bank at 1% at or 5% to get a dollar at the end of 100 years. A teeny tiny amount? A penny or two because of compounding interest? Yes? So if it's a dollar receivable in 100 years, it's worth present, present discounted value. Present discounted value is very little. OK, so back to the triangle. So this is stuff like 100 years away, uh, 80 years away, 60 years away, 40 years away, whatever. So with a high interest rate, you don't have all that stuff because we discount the hell out of it. Whereas with a low interest rate, it's more viable because even though it's far away, we have such a low interest rate, we don't discount the future so heavily. Okay. Now let's get to out my man Alan Greenspan and Ben Bernanke. Whenever I mention government employees, you're supposed to boo. <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. What did these cretins do? I mean, what did these gentlemen do? <laughs> what they did is they artificially lowered the rate of interest. 
ba I mean the, the bad guys. They artificially, in other words, they screwed up the economy. Now there are people saying things like, I've got some quotes here. What is it? Um, uh. <coughs> Alan Greenspan admitted that he had put too much faith in the self-correcting power of the market. That's the New York Times. This is the end of libertarianism, Newsweek. Sarkozy of France, laissez-faire economics, self-regulation of the view that the all-powerful market always knows best or finished. Uh, Peter Steinbrook, the German finance minister, Americans' laissez-faire ideology as practiced during the subprime crisis was as simplistic as it is dangerous. New York Times, the U.S. has a culture that celebrates laissez-faire capitalism as the I economic ideal. I don't know what world these guys are living in. We don't have laissez-faire capitalism. We have a Fed. We don't have the gold standard. We have, uh, we have fiat government currency. Uh, and we have the Fed that artificially lowered interest rates. We, in laissez-faire capitalism, um, money, well, let me take two minutes to decide or explain why we have money. Why do we have money? The reason we have money is because of a thing called double coincidence of wants. I have a tie and I'm looking for someone who has a cell phone, but I'm looking for someone who has a cell phone that wants a tie. Can you imagine the difficulty I'm going to have? That's a double coincidence of wants. Namely, I have to find someone who's got what I want and is willing to take what I've got to trade for it. I mean, if that's the way we ran the economy, we couldn't trade. And if we can't trade, then we have to be self-sufficient. And despite Obama's uh, push towards self-sufficiency, we, we can't be dependent on foreign oil and can't be dependent on anything. Self-sufficiency is a recipe for death. 99% uh, of the human population owes its very lives to the fact that we can trade and specialize. Because imagine if we couldn't trade and specialize, we'd have to produce everything for ourselves. We'd have to produce food, clothing, and shelter, medical care, cello lessons, whatever. We'd all die. Because the reason we're alive is because you can do the cello lessons, you can do the food, you can do the clothing, and then we can trade, and then we're much more efficient. But with a double coincidence of wants, we can't trade, we can't trade, we can't live. So what we do is instead of tr looking for a double coincidence of wants, we make a, a two-stage uh, kind of a thing. First, I take my tie, and I trade it in for... I don't know, uh, chalk. Because everyone likes chalk. We're all academics. We, we live or die by chalk. And, and I know that other people will accept chalk because every, it's a community of uh, scholars and we all need chalk. And then what I do is I make a second trade, chalk, for a cell phone. And now we can trade. And now we've overcome the difficulties of the double coincidence of wants. Am I speaking too fast? I'm from Brooklyn. You know, we go, we go fast. Okay. Well, should it be chalk? What should be the intermediary? By the way, this is what money is. It's, all money is is it an intermediary of trade. And our friends from the left who say money is evil, all they're saying is that trade is evil. Silly. All money is is a trade facilitator. Right now, see, previously we had barter when we were trading the tie for the cell phone. Now, we've got an intermediary, money. Well, what, what would be a good money? Would bananas be a good money? No, because they rot in, you know, two days and they're gone. Chalk isn't that great. It's not very valuable per weight and per cubic. Very cheap. Uh, there, there was competition, you know, fish hooks, uh, salt, sugar. Uh, cowrie shells, tobacco, all sorts of things were money at various times. There was this Radford guy who was talking about in a um, Nazi concentration camp or some concentration camp. They were trading cigarettes, using cigarettes as money. Well, finally, out of this competitive struggle for what should be the money came gold and silver and maybe copper for small change. And that's market money. That's free enterprise money. And the benefit of that is that the rascals uh, uh, have, um, 
handcuffs, the, the rascals being the government. See, there are only three ways that the government can get money. One is by taxing, and everyone knows who's doing the taxing. They can't blame taxes on private enterprise. They, they haven't come that far yet, although I'm sure they're working on it. The second one is borrowing. The problem with borrowing is that these rascals are sort of out of borrowing. Here is the amount of borrowing. I don't know if you can see it. I wish I had a, a screen, but I'm a sort of a low-tech guy. The first bump is the uh, U.S. Depression of 1929, 33, 37. The second one is now. You see how much more we're borrowing now than we were before? So there's sort of out of borrowing room. And they're going to bomb the Chinese if, or the Indians or whoever it is that doesn't continue to borrow and buy up debt. The third one is inflation. And inflation is great from their point of view because they, they can blame it on us. They can blame it on greedy businessmen, greedy consumers, greedy unions. Now, I'm no fan of unions, but I don't think inflation is caused by unions. Greed. Uh, in other words, they can say, well, it's not our fault. So getting back to this, what they did is they artificially lowered the interest rate. Artificially lowering the interest rate means that you start with some sort of triangle like that, and then here's triangle one, and then you go into triangle two. What you do is you artificially encourage investments in heavy industry. And then you can't keep inflating. The problem with inflation is you have expectations. See, initially when they start inflating and people expect if the prices have always been what they were, if this is time, and this is prices, and prices have always been flat forever, and now the government somehow gets us out of the gold standard and onto a fiat currency, and starts increasing the supply of money, why? For the same reason that if you had a little printing press that could come out with a $100 bill, uh, that could be indistinguishable from it turning away, yeah, you'd be blistering your thumb and turning out $100 bills. Well, that's the government. I mean, they, they too like money. I'm willing to concede they're human. It's a little concession, but... <laughs> okay, so here are prices. And prices have always been the same. And all of a sudden, uh, they've been up and down. And there's been a tendency, a trend. Glad you can see. This is increasing. When it goes up, it continues. But eventually, people monitor. I agree with the Chicago. The reason we have inflation or what inflation is is increased. But then what happens? So right now, in, in stage one, money is going up is a being level. Later on in stage two, there's a correlation. Money goes up by a little bit and prices go up by a little bit. But then you get into a, this is the Zimbabwean stage or the stage where uh, if you have Prices be much higher tomorrow than today, so you're going to spend it today before the prices double every two hours. So you spend, spend, spend. And those expenses lead to even... Books, I think, is a tiger by the tail. When you have a tiger by the tail, it's sort of rough. Right now, it's okay. He's not turning around and eating you, but if you drop off, you're in trouble. That's the problem of the Fed. When they increase... The Lower interest rates. They can't continually justify these investments here. They have to stop eventually. And when they do, all of these investments, for example, have Microsoft. 
Microsoft isn't heavy, but there's a time dimension by the, from the day that they start a new project to the day it comes to the consumer. It could be this. Um, Caterpillar, um, equipment. term thing. It takes a long time to build a house, especially if you feel and the manufacturing that it takes to make the bricks, how long a house lasts. So these are heavy industries. In other words, the reason we're having a crisis, or rather the part of the economy that is in a crisis, is the heavy stuff, or the long-term stuff. And the reason we're having these crises is because of previous government interventions, mainly increasing the money supply which is what Obama is now planning to do. And I don't blame him, personally. I mean, Bush did the same thing. They're all a bunch of rascals. I'm an equal opportunity hater, white, black, it doesn't matter. So it's not a racist thing. I'm not saying you know, he's bad because he's black or anything. He's bad because he's doing roughly what Bush is doing. He's got the, he hasn't fired, what's his face? Bernanke. Nor, and Greenspan stayed on for many administrations. He hasn't gotten rid of the Fed. Okay, so one of the causes of the problem is past uh, governmental uh, misdeeds. There are certain parallels between now and 1929, 1946. The Depression really lasted, according to Bob Higgs, not from 1929 to 1939, and then the war. What did is he the severity of the Depression? If you look at the, uh, the, 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 the differences in uh, GDP and time. And here is 1913. Here's when the Fed came in. If you look at the oscillations before and after, it's sort of like this. I'm just drawing it freehand. <laughs> but the, the point is that before the Fed began, the oscillations were much less than after the Fed began. So if you believe in empirical stuff, which these guys say they do, but they don't really, we should get rid of the Fed because the Fed is uh, the fox in the chicken coop. The Fed is the bad guy here. The Fed is creating the problem. The way to get rid of the problem is to get rid of the Fed. Uh, I've got some other show and tell stuff here. The, the Fed, here is an um, indication of what they've been doing with the money stock. You can see that the money stock has been increasing like a bunch of drunken sailors. Here's what they've been doing with interest rates. The interest rates are going up. These are the interest rates, not of the market, but interest rates set by the, by the Fed. These guys are uh, a bunch of drunkards. I mean, acting like drunkards anyway. Okay, so that's one of the problems. Um, well. In the Depression, what the, what the government did uh, in the 1930s is they um, try to keep wages up. And high wages means unemployment. Because if you have a supply and demand of labor, and this is the minimum wage law diagram. Here is the supply of labor. Here is the demand for labor. Here is the quantity of labor. Here is wage. If you keep wages artificially higher than the equilibrium to move otherwise, you just have unemployment. This difference between supply and demand, when there's a greater supply of labor than demand for labor, that's unemployment. Well, they kept wages up. And if you try to lower the depression, it is they had this thing called the Smoot-Hawley tariff. which is roughly what Obama's doing. I heard him on the, the, the TV the other day, and he's just babbling about how we've got to be independent of oil and independent, which means we shouldn't trade with other countries, which means we should raise tariffs or quantity uh, control. Nothing. Nothing and deepen the depression. What's the equivalent nowadays to smooth Hawley? That's Obama. What's the equivalent or the counterpart to keeping wages up? That's a thing called the CRA. What's the CRA? CRA is a few. Okay. What's going on? It all started with the Boston Fed. 
Boston said is evil. In fact, but they're particularly here with regard to housing because they had this thing that banks were racist. Why were banks racist? Because black people were getting fewer loans than white people in the Boston area. Their study was. And it's true, black people were getting fewer loans than white people. The, the rate of turndowns was higher for black than white. Um, why is this? Uh, did anyone ever see this? People. Now, what he was doing is getting in the white face. No one saw this? Pathetic. You people are uneducated. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of a school is this where they all Eddie Murphy? I mean, man. So what? <laughs> face. And he gets on a bus, and there are white people and black people, and everyone's just sitting there. And then all the stuff like that. And, and he, as he walks, he walks like a white person. I have to clench my butt. You know, is it, is it? Then he goes into a bank, and he gets to a black bank teller. And he says, I'd like a loan. And the guy says, well, collateral. No income, no, what the hell is G? No, job. There's no G in here. Job, no, no income, no job, no address, no assets. That, that used to be the criteria for loans on the part of the bank. Do you have a, a job? Do you have um, assets? Do you have a credit? Is credit. So that's what the black teller is asking Eddie Murphy. And Eddie's just sort of sitting there. And then uh, the black guy, black banker's boss, says to the black banker, I'll take care of this guy. And he says, you need here. Here, here's money. <laughs> As Eddie Murphy, but th this was just precious. Well, you see, what happened was previously, you wanted a loan. Probably had to have assets. You had credit rating, you had to have this, you had to have that, all sorts of things. And for various reasons, too, whites had this thing called redlining. What's redlining? Redlining is here is a map of the city. These are all the streets. And we notice that in this area, people aren't repaying their loans. Can everyone see this? Or? So we put a red line around that neighborhood, and we don't give any screw. It just so happened this area that's red line had more for various reasons. Black people didn't repay their loans. We don't have reasons for that, but that was the fact. So from these facts, the Boston Fed said that this is unconscious. Industry. We were talking about well, one of the heaviest in the Boston Fed was things like, you know, now what they do is they have a for you know, bank accounts and the It's a thing called, uh, here we go, a thing called wire loans. This is, so you say, sure, I, I own the sun, the moon, and the earth. And they say, but they don't ask to, for proof, so you just lie. They have a thing, down payment loans. Previously, in order to get a mortgage, you had to pay, oh, you 
the way for the down payment so you have no, uh, what do you call it? Um, ATM loans, in other words, you use this sort of as, as an ATM machine. Okay, so what they're now doing is out the things that they artificially encourage. Um, th this thing, uh, let me talk not about the big three. I used to call them the big three, but I'll now call them the mediocre three. Ford, um, Chrysler, and uh, GM. This is part of the Rust Belt. You know, I used to teach at the uh, College of the Holy Cross in Worcester, Mass. And Worcester, Mass. was part of the Rust Belt. And what they did is they made metal, uh, iron. They didn't make steel, but they made things out of steel like wire brushes and wall bearings and wrenches and things like that. And there must be, it's a small town, maybe 200,000 people. And there, there must be, oh, 10 or 15 of these factories, all empty, big factories. You drive by them, and it's a quarter of a mile by a quarter of a mile. And they're six stories high. That's big. One of them started being yuppified. I think they filled in the bottom floor. But the whole thing was yuppified. Uh, the whole thing was rust belted. Why? Because the unions demanded wages higher than productivity levels. And the companies couldn't exist. If you're paying more for workers than, than they're producing, there's only one way out of that, and that's bankruptcy. So what they all did is they came down to around here. Uh, Birmingham, Alabama, Mississippi, parts of Tennessee, um, uh, cities like, uh, states like that. The reason the Detroit is in trouble is it's just the Rust Belt. See, in, in the free enterprise system, if a company doesn't succeed in satisfying, it goes broke, which is good because the ones that remain are the ones who are satisfying customers. That's why we crisis with chalk or wristwatches or ties or, or pizza or anything like that. If the pizza from this company, what company is this? Michelangelo's Pizza? If the pizza was lousy, we don't order their pizza. We order Papa Doc or John or somebody's pizza. And they go broke. That's why pizza... Because we have this automatic feedback mechanism where if you don't do a good job in business, you go broke. Well, but if you start propping up failing companies, it's very equivalent to start raising wages higher than they otherwise would have been. That's no way to cure a depression. The bailout companies that should be uh, go the way of Pan Am or Studebaker or whatever. Look, th that's what makes our country so great, our economy so great. We're not any better or smarter than the Russians. Uh, most of the grandmasters in chess are Russians. They had Sputnik. They're bright people. They're not stupid. Why were they practically starving? Why is that North Korea is starving and South Korea is doing pretty well? They're the same people. They have the same abilities. It's rather that one has a system that's vaguely capitalist, not as capitalist as it should be, but somewhat, whereas the other are a bunch of commies. Well, Obama and Bush, uh, it's not just Obama. Bush was doing this too. He was having bailout things. Th this is just the, the exact wrong way to go. It's sort of like in the body, if the dead cells are not allowed to go, you don't have room for new live cells. Now, this thing about bailouts, th this is just crazy. It's sort of like trying to press down the water in the bathtub and expecting that um, the water will go down, or taking the water from the deep end of the pool and putting it in the uh, shallow end and expecting the shallow end to go higher. It's just silly. Look, if we take money from 
away from A and give it to B, yes, B will do better, but A will do worse. What's he talking about, taking $1.3 trillion and giving it to various people? Right? Isn't that his program? Well, where is he going to get it from? He's going to get it either from taxing or borrowing or inflation. If he taxes it, then Peter has the money, but Paul doesn't. So where is the big advantage? If he borrows, well, th then he diverts money from private borrowing to public borrowing. And if he does inflation, we have other problems. So the way out of this crisis is to embrace laissez-faire capitalism. Uh, you know, th th these Keynesians, they have the view that the way we can get out of the depression is by spending our way out of the depression. Right now, they're, they're doing the, um, the NBA, right here, the NBA, National Basketball Association. They're starting their all-star thing. One of the commentators said, the way they ought to do it is the way we used to do it when we were kids. You get the two best players, and they flip a coin, and then this guy picks a member of his team, and then this guy picks a member of his team, and this guy does, right? That's the, the way we used to do it when we were kids. You, you play ball and you get two of the good people and they pick their teams. Well look, suppose you were going off on an island or to Mars or somewhere and you were picking your team. And I say, over here, there are these big fat slug kind of people who are great consumers. They'll consume their 10 times their weight in consumption. They can't produce squat, but they can consume. And over here are people who can produce. Well, they have to eat, but they can produce. They're doctors, they're lawyers, they're... Lawyers are very important. Without lawyers, we don't have civilization. They're doctors, they're lawyers, they're engineers, they're nurses, they're uh, carpenters. Who are you going to pick for your team if you want to have uh, an economy that's viable? Consumers? Of course not. There's no virtue in being a consumer. If uh, being a consumer was so great, Zimbabwe would be a um, uh, um, paradise because they, they, they got trillions of dollars. You go to the average Zimbabwean, you ask him how much money he's got, he's got $10 trillion in his wallet. He can consume a lot. Because uh, it's silly to think that we uh, can consume our way out of the depression. The way to uh, get our way out of the depression is to encourage saving, because saving is the only thing that will uh, save those investments, the ones that are worthy of saving, and not all of them are. So. To conclude, summarize, what I've said is that the government is a, a bad guy, both morally and economically, with regard to the depression. The government caused it. The only way the can, government can solve the problem is by embracing laissez-faire capitalism. And if they don't, they'll just uh, lengthen the depression and deepen it. So it's been about an hour, and I was told to yak on for an hour. So I've now yak. And now I'll have questions, uh, objections, whatever. Everyone agree with everything I've said? <laughs> I thought I was being pretty radical, but you know, I see this is a, a tough crew here. Young lady. If I'm so against government, what do I think about railroads and monopolies? Industries that really can't be competitive by their very nature. Well, it's a little off my subject here. This is more antitrust economics or antitrust law. Um, I have to tell you my antitrust joke, and I'm sorry to the people I had breakfast with. Uh, Got to do it again. This is the best way to deal that I've ever found to deal with the antitrust. It's a two-part joke. I told this joke in, in front of a bunch of economists and, and lawyers. I used to have a roommate. You know Ben Klein? Very famous economist. He was my roommate. And he was in monetary economics. We were both getting PhDs in economics. And finally he said, you know, there's no money. Namely, there's no money for a monetary economist. It's too for an economist is in antitrust because then you go on all these very expensive cases and you testify. I had a whole bunch of antitrust economists and lawyers who did antitrust. This series of two jokes. The first joke is there were three Soviet prisoners and as prisoners, the 
comparing notes as to why they're in prison. And the first guy said, well, I'm in prison because I came to work late. And they accused me of cheating the state out of my labor services. And the second guy said, well, I came and they accused me of brown nosing. The third guy said, I came to work every day exactly on time, and they accused me of owning the wristwatch. <laughs> and, and this one got some, some jokes, uh, some laughter from this group. Now I told the, the US three prisoners, all in jail on antitrust policies, and the first guy said, well, I was put in jail because I was accused of profiteering and, uh, and, and um, uh, charging too much for my monopoly. And the second guy said, I was put in jail for charging too little predatory pricing. And the third guy said, I charge the same prices as everyone else. It's hard to see how he did, given these other two guys, but it's just a joke. You have to. And they put me in jail for collusion or price fixing. <laughs> well, see, I get a little joke here because you people are not yet in antitrust, but as soon as you are, and oh no, this is not a good joke because what I'm trying to say is that the law is, is not a proper law. A proper law distinguishes between licit and illicit behavior. The law of theft does, or fraud. If you commit theft or fraud, you go to jail. If you don't, you don't. No matter what you do, higher, lower, the same prices, you're guilty of an antitrust thing. Look, the, the problem with Bill Gates wasn't uh, that he was monopolizing or anything. It's that he wasn't paying off the boys in Washington. And I said, what? You know, we can't have Bill Gates earning all these billions and not giving us any. Let's get him. Well, how can we get him? Let's get him on, well, not rape or murder. It's hard, but antitrust. He's got to be guilty of some violation. Let's go and find one. Uh, there are no natural monopolies. There are no industries for which you can't have competition. Everything can be competitive, if you just think about it a bit. Uh, railroads. Um, the most famous case was this um, muckraking novel, The Octopus, where they had one railroad up and down California. And here's California. And there was a railroad. And the railroad was acting very capriciously, charging high prices, changing prices at the last minute, not you know, being nice. Uh, they were really exploiting the farmers. So you'd think that the farmers would have got together and made a co-op and said, hey, we'll put a railroad over here. The second railroad, and then, you know, and just the fear, you see, you don't have to have actual competition. Just potential competition is enough to make a monopoly, not a monopolist, a single seller of something. The word monopoly should be reserved for government grants of privilege, like the post office or taxi cab medallions where it's illegal to compete. But just because there's a single seller, they, they fear potential competition. But there was no potential competition in this case. Why not? Because the only way to get a railroad is to get government permission. And these guys had bribed uh, or suborned all the um, California state politicians so they wouldn't allow any other railroad to come about. Let me give you another case. Uh, during Jim Crow, blacks had to ride in the back of the bus. Right? They couldn't ride in the front. And there was a very famous case. There was this black woman who violated the law and sat in the front and wouldn't give a seat up for a white man. What was her name? Rosa Parks. So I asked myself, if the blacks feel aggrieved that they can't ride in the front of the bus, does this not open up a market opportunity for an entrepreneur? Sure. I'll start my own bus company. I'll say, look, blacks, you can ride in the front, the back, uh, the middle. I don't care. I'll charge you twice as much, but what the heck? Because, you know, I've got to make a profit. And then if another bus company comes in, they'll reduce my extra profits through competition. And eventually, I won't be able to charge any more. But initially, this is a big incentive. So why didn't somebody, white, black, blue, green, yellow, start another bus company and said, hey, blacks, you can ride wherever you want? No, the reason that no other bus company could start is you need government permission to start a bus company. So you might say, well, buses are a natural monopoly. Yeah, they're no ma natural monopoly. Anyone can start a another bus. Right, but the point is that this is, is coming from the government. If it was just up to private people, even if they were all racists, say, 
Well, a black person could start. Person, the only uh, color is green, as in money. I mean, he's a prejudiced person in favor of green. He doesn't care white, black, blue, just as long as it's green. He could have started the bus, but this is exactly my point. The reason you didn't have the competition is not due to natural forces or anything like that. It was due to the, the bloody government, uh, either by making any bus company uh, keep the blacks in the back, or by not allowing other bus companies to come in in the first place. So th this natural monopoly is, um, I think, a non-starter. I'm on this sort of lecture tour. I just gave a speech in Knoxville. And the whole thing was on roads, private highways. And I'm, I don't have enough time to go into that. But if any of you are interested, here is my email address. Just email me and say Monopoly or Rhodes or something, and I'll give you enough bibliography to choke a horse. <laughs> in other words, all this stuff has been written on, and I can't do justice to that. I mean, I spent a whole hour on that. Here I'm talking about uh, the economic crisis, not about that, so I, I'll have to stop my answer there. Yes, sir? What would happen is that Detroit would um, have troubles because there'd be vast unemployment. If they didn't have unemployment insurance, somebody else would come into Detroit, and, and if they didn't have a unionized Velcro uh, and and they're all unemployed, to go to get jobs. Yep. Somebody else would come in there and uh, oh, those guys are making they're making 75 bucks an hour for being on, on the assembly line, which is not a, really a skilled job. All you do is you turn a wrench or you put the car door on or you put the steering wheel on. They're making $75 an hour. They, they deserve to go bankrupt because they're not being part of the cooperative economic system. So, um, Detroit, um, if they didn't give the bailout and, and everything else stayed the same, namely they had this unionized philosophy, they would just live on welfare. Be like an inner city or uh, the Atlantic Canada. Just a oh, there is unemployment insurance. Somebody else would come in there, buy up those factories, and set up, I don't know what, bicycles, skates, who knows, toys, and employ them at much lower wages. But when the wages get to be $75 an hour for, for jobs that are, you know, worth 20 an hour or something, I'm just making these numbers up you know, for open purposes, this is economically unviable. Oh, ah, I, I thought it just mentioned Detroit. But bailout is a bailout is a bailout. Roses are roses. Look, the way to get the monetary system back in order is to go back to gold, to go back to free market money. This is the Ron Paul uh, solution with which I uh, certainly fully uh, concur. Uh, the reason that we have that we have route, get them out of everything. If you go to the minarchist route like Ayn Rand, then government should have one function protect persons and property, and to that end have three divisions. Armies to keep, what is it, 800 foreign military bases in 130 different countries? That's not defense, that's offense. So you have armies to keep foreign bad guys off of you. Police to keep local bad guys off of you. Not have percent of all the prisoners are now in drugs just legalized drugs.
Thanking, thanking is, is uh, it has two functions. The first function of banking is an intermediary or a tailor. Only they don't tailor cloth, they tailor money. What a tailor does, he takes a big, big swath of cloth and he turns it into a shirt or a jacket. What a banker does in this function is there are some, uh, there might be a hundred people with five bucks each that want to lend the money to the bank. And then there's another guy who wants to borrow a hundred bucks. So he tailors these little loans and gives it to the big guy. Or there might be a big guy who wants to put a, a million dollars in the bank and then he gives out 10,000 to this guy, 10,000 to that guy. So that's one function. The other function of banking is, um, what's the other function of banking? Uh, storage. You know, you, you move, you're all students, you're always moving around between, you know, you, you're here in um, Nashville, you have a job in Chicago, you have to go find a house, then you, what you do is you put all your furniture in storage. Well, bank stores money. That's all it does. No magic here, no complexity. The big complexity is when you get the government involved. So uh, the government shouldn't be bailing out anyone, even if, given that we have a government, it should stick to its very limited function. Yeah. Yeah. Once upon a time, long, long ago, there was a um, situation of double coincidence of wants and we had ties and chalk and, and finally we had a competition and, and uh, gold won out. Okay, so what happened is you, um, the way to do it is you don't have a bank, a horse, you give them two ounces of gold. It became uh, difficult, you know, people didn't want to walk around with gold in their pockets they wanted to, they were afraid of thieves. There were thieves in this bygone era. Who had the biggest safe in town? Turns Taylor's gold into gold. Turns bad jewelry into gold. He had the biggest So what you would do is you would leave your money there and then when you wanted to go buy a horse, you would go and, and what he would do is give you a warehouse receipt for the gold. So you deposited 10 ounces of gold in the warehouse bank, and he gave you a receipt for 10 ounces of gold, and now you needed uh, two ounces to go buy a horse. So you went back to the goldsmith and said, hey, uh, give me uh, two ounces of gold. And he said, okay, give me back that receipt for 10 ounces, and I'll give you a receipt for eight ounces and two ounces of gold. And you went and you bought your horse. But then later on, people got lazy or more efficient, and instead of uh, going to the bank and um, It's 10 one ounce receipts. So you go to the horse trade and say, look, I got my money with Joe the, the goldsmith. You bank there too. You recognize his signature on this warehouse receipt. Don't make me go to the bank and get the money and then you have to uh, go and get the money. Let me just give you two of my warehouse receipts for two ounces of gold. Give me the horse and you keep it. And the guy said, okay. And this is all compatible with free enterprise and it's economically efficient. Then one day, the banker's wife, it's always a woman's fault, <laughs> said she needs a mink coat and she needs a carriage with 10 horses. And uh, the, uh, the other guy uh, gave his wife that and what's wrong with you? And the, this guy said, you know, I've got uh, warehouse receipts outstanding for 10,000 ounces of gold and I've got 10,000 ounces of gold in my warehouse. I wonder what would happen <laughs> If I just created a few extra warehouse receipts, like maybe uh, 10 extra ones, and now I have 10,000 ounces of gold, and I now have 10,000 and 10 warehouse receipts. Is that clear? The only time I'm going to get tarred and feathered is if everybody comes in all at once and says, give me my gold, then I'm messed up, right? Then they'll tar and feather me, they'll kill me because, you know, I'll owe somebody 10 ounces 
of gold and I won't have it. And he did that, and he got away with it. And they said, whoa, hey, I'm, I'm on to something. Maybe I'll do uh, 11,000. Now the, fra the reserve ratio is 10 elevenths, 9 tenths, 90 percent roughly. As long as there's no mass run. Did anyone see that movie, well, uh, It's a Wonderful Life, with the bank run? See, most of the economics, Eddie Murphy, bank, you know, <laughs> it's just, just novels and, and movies. They had a bank run. And the reason they had a bank run is we, because we have fractional reserve banking. The Austro-Libertarian view is that this is a crime. And I've written several articles on that, and other people have written articles. Murray Rothbard has written um, a book or two. I'm, I'm sure Bob Higgs, uh, Bob Higgs, um, Bob Murphy has written on this. Um, Bob, what's your email address? You know what the ANCAP stands for? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, Bob is more of an expert on these things than I am. He could probably give you more feedback on fractional reserve banking. Next question. Yes, sir. Well, that's a complex question. It's not unrelated. Uh, you see, the U.S. dollar is sort of like the gold standard because the reason the U.S. dollar is the international medium of exchange is because the U.S. dollar was the most reliable, God help us, because it's a crappy dollar. And it's been crappy in the latest Bush stages. It used to be that the dollar was as good as gold. Well, not really. But they printed up too much of it. See, we have this thing called the euro dollar market where people, we've been living high off the hog. We print up money and we give it to people and they give us TVs and Toyotas. And then they use it to in intermediate trade. I mean, a lot of the drug trade is intimated with $100 bills and it used to be $1,000 bills. So we, we have more TVs and Toyotas than we would otherwise have because our money was trusted. But now the euro is looking better. In the recent years, the dollar has been declining compared to a lot of dollars. Bob, do you want to add to the, my answer to that question? Okay. Another? Yes, sir. Yes. The, oh, we'll get slapped because when you screw up the economy, you lose real goods and services for years. They will have to be, uh, the piper will have to be paid. We'll be worse off than if this hadn't occurred. Uh, but Roger Garrison sometimes characterizes this as you need uh, 10 bricks, but you only produce nine is the interest rate, and now they're, they're going to be uh, half-built factories or empty factories, and you go around now looking at shopping malls and, you know, one out of ten are empty. Yeah, you're going to have problems like that. But if, if we have, let's say, fair capitalism and if we had flexible wage rates and prices, uh, it would be short and sweet. Before 1913, the depressions would last six months or 18 months, and that would be it. Nowadays, uh, it's a lot longer. So yes, uh, the piper has to be paid when you make errors, when you divert money into areas that are not compatible with, with what the people want. You have a problem. Look, suppose we decide we're all too fat. We had too much of this pizza. We want to go on a diet. So what does that mean? It means that we're going to stop eating chocolate and pizza and ice cream. We're going to start eating rabbit food, celery, um, tomatoes, carrots. Well, what's going to happen to the prices of chocolate and ice cream? Fall. And what's going to happen to the profits in those areas? It's going to fall. What's going to happen to the celery industry? It's going to boom. Namely, 
Previously, the allocation between celery and chocolate was conforming with our wishes. Now it's not. Now we want more celery and less chocolate. Well, then, then there's excess chocolate. There's resources put in the chocolate and, and, and um, things, uh, uh, what do you call it, compatible uh, with chocolate, like mixing machines or certain labor that's good in chocolate and not in celery or salads or whatever it is. So there's a vast misallocation of resources, personal, uh, human resources, physical resources. And uh, a chocolate vat mixing machine might not be able to be used for celery at all. It never should have been made in the first place, given our new desires. Well, you see, this occurs every day in the market. That's why the market is not perfect, because people keep changing and capital is fixed. Chocolate mixing machines can't be converted into whatever something else. So you lose out. But, but there's not what Murray Rothbard calls a cluster of error. Yeah, there's an error here, there's an error there, there are all sorts of errors, and they're all being continually fixed. Namely, you stop producing chocolate mixing machines, and you start producing things that are um, uh, complementary to celery. Okay? But what we have here is a cluster of error where there's a gigantic misallocation of resources toward this part of the triangle and away from what, where it should have been. So just as you lose out on chocolate mixing machines, you're going to lose out on too many mines, too many houses. We built houses that were too big for too many people. We didn't need that many houses. It was artificially encouraged with houses, with this ninja business with the Boston Fed. So yes, there'll be losses. But the losses will be, you know, quick under capitalism. And if he keeps making the same mistakes, inflating, which caused the thing in the first place, and now he's doing more of it? Well, we'll continue it. It's sort of like trying to put out a fire with uh, gasoline. You pour gasoline on the fire and say, whoa, the fire's getting bigger. What happened? Unfortunately, the Austrians, Bob Murphy is just tangled with uh, two of the biggies, um, Becker and Krugman. Well, Becker and Krugman uh, condescended. They lowered themselves to criticize um, Austrians. And they showed evidence of not understanding the Austrians. Bob, do you want to mention that a little? Yeah, uh, Bob Murphy, I was calling. Namely, what Krugman was saying was, well, if it's like this, how come we increased here? And what Bob is saying is we increased by capital consumption, and we can't continue doing that forever. Yes, sir. Well, this will be on tape, so if you missed part of it. What, what day is it? Okay. Sure. Why don't you give me the announcements? I'll put them right here. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. So when you leave, take one of these. Well, let, let him just ask his one question, and then we'll, then we'll answer. Sure. Well, 
in order to promote liberty, I think you have to convert, oh, 10 or 15% of the population, but not just any old 10 or 15%, the, the intelligentsia, the leaders of the society. And leaders of society are not likely to be changed because they're doing pretty well under the present circumstance. So it's difficult. We have sociobiological difficult to predict. And that is that we're all hardwired through genetics to appreciate explicit cooperation. Because we used to live in groups when we were in the trees or in the caves of 75 people, all of whom you would know because they were your relatives. And if one person was hurt, you'd help them. And if you didn't, the whole tribe would die. So biologically, we, if you see a crying baby, the natural you pick them up and give them hardwired implicit cooperation through markets. Let me give you an example. During Katrina, or in the aftermath of Katrina, the prices of things skyrocketed. Gasoline, flashlight batteries, milk, orange juice. This was implicit cooperation. The high prices in New Orleans was a way of attracting resources into New Orleans, which would have pushed down the prices. But people didn't appreciate that. They said this is price gouging. They wanted to throw them in jail. Every time I got a freshman class, they're all a bunch of pinkos. Because they're hardwired for pinkoism and appreciate explicit cooperation, but can't see implicit cooperation through the market, like this thing with the chocolate and the celery. That's just a way of cooperating with each other. We don't have to go to Obama or we don't want chocolate, we want celery. It occurs automatically. The market has within itself the means for helping us to coordinate. And when the government stops it, and the government gets away with stopping it, because we don't appreciate God. Only through economics, do a few people understand this, but we're, we're biased against it by our biology. Okay, well, I think we now have to end. Come get one of these. <laughs>